Hi everyone and welcome to this webinar focused on pediatric outboard syndrome. Note that Clive Co closed captioning is available throughout the whole session by click on the, clicking on the CC button on your screen. We'll also be, re be recording this session for others uh, for later and we'll, we'll upload it to our YouTube channel. My name is Lisa Bonebreak. I'm an Alport patient, proud parent of two young men, one who inherited my X-linked gene mutation and one who did not. I'm also the executive director of Alport Syndrome Foundation. I'll be today's moderator. And my fantastic colleague, the only other ASF staff person, Kevin Schnur, is behind the scenes running tech for us today. I'm honored to introduce our featured speaker, Dr. Bradley Wardy. Note that we invited him to answer questions today. He won't be making a presentation. We were really sure we could fill up his time well with questions. Many of you sent questions in advance, thank you. So we're gonna to plan to get to those first. So please sit back and listen to those questions as they may cover uh, a lot of things you might be interested in knowing about. And once we get through those, I'll monitor the Q&A function. Please use the Q&A function to ask your questions and I'll make sure those get through to Dr. Wardy. Dr. Bradley Wardy is the McLaughlin Family Endowed Chair in Nephrology, Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine. He's also the directors of both the Division of Nephrology and of Dialysis and Transplantation at Children's Mercy, Kansas City. He currently serves as co-principal investigator of the International Pediatric Peritoneal Dial Dialysis Network and the multi-center National Institutes of Health funded Chronic Kidney Disease and Children's Study very a longitudinal study called CKID. He's also a council member for the International Pediatric Nephrology Association, has published more than 300 articles and book chapters. He volunteers at a high level for the National Kidney Foundation. And also we're honored he serves on the Alport Syndrome Foundation's Medical Advisory Committee. He has many other prestigious titles and roles as well, but I'm sure you get the picture that he is, our guest is incredibly well qualified to answer our questions today. We're really excited and honored to have him. Welcome Dr. Wardy, and we're gonna jump right into these questions that patients have asked for you Thanks. Thanks, today. Um, the first one, I'm just gonna start with a very timely one that lots of people ask about, and that is, do you have any concerns about any of the currently approved COVID vaccines for pediatric outport patients under the age of 18? Is that something you have any concerns about? Uh, well, first of all, thanks for the invitation. I, I, again, I, I am, I've been looking forward to having this opportunity to share some thoughts. And as I told uh, Lisa and Kevin before this uh, session started, you know, I see this as very casual sitting around talking to your, to your, your pediatrician, to your nephrologist, just asking some questions. So feel free to ask anything. Um, I'll tell you what I know and I'll tell you what I don't know. Um, so, uh, you know, I get a lot of questions, as you might imagine, about the COVID vaccine uh, almost every day from, from my patients. And um, what's been challenging is that the information changes almost every day. But the current information would suggest that the COVID vaccine, and, and really I'm talking about two vaccines, the uh, Moderna vaccine obviously is, is one of them. Um, and um, I'm blanking on the name of the other vaccine. Um, the Pfizer. Uh, Pfizer vaccine, oh my gosh, I'm starting <laughs> off well, aren't I? Yeah, uh, the Pfizer vaccine. Both of those vaccines uh, were developed in a very, very similar manner. Uh, and everything that we know to date is that they're safe. now. Of course, they were only tested on 30 to 40,000 people each, but now in the U.S. alone, there's been about 65 million people uh, that have received the vaccine uh, with very, very few side effects. Now, of course, when you look at these vaccines, and, and remember, there's two shots given with the vaccines. The Pfizer uh, one is given, and then another one in three weeks, and the Moderna one is given, and then the second one in four weeks. And that second vaccine is oftentimes associated with some symptoms of maybe some chills, some fever, some headache, but that's sort of a typical response to the vaccine. And in fact, some people think that's your immune system actually working. Uh, and so that's not a bad thing, uh, but it's not, a, it's not a kind of a side effect where you should say, I don't wanna get that vaccine. Um, the vaccines to be very, very effective, probably 95% effective if you get both vaccines uh, as opposed to one. If you only get one vaccine, it's probably only about 52% effective. So you really wanna get both vaccines. But I have been recommending it to all of my uh, patients with chronic kidney disease. Um, so those even pre-dialysis and pre-transplant, but also to those who have been transplanted and those who are on dialysis. I think that all of all those individuals are at higher risk 
for a complicated course with COVID-19. Uh, and so I am recommending the vaccine for all of those folks. But at the same time, I think we all have to recognize that the vaccine does not necessarily prevent uh, one to pass on the infection to somebody else. So you can get the vaccine and that probably precludes you from getting very ill and hospitalized, but it doesn't necessarily prevent you from being infected and thus contagious and passing it on to somebody else. So we're still recommending all the same, um, you know, public health kind of recommendations, masking, hand hygiene, social distancing, even though those many individuals have received the vaccine. So the long and short of it is in the U.S., it's been, you know, very traumatic, if you will, to have 500,000 people uh, die of this. But we, we are seeing the numbers now decrease. We're seeing the hospitalizations decrease. We're seeing the mortality decrease. So this is not the time to take the foot you know, off the gas pedal. We need to sort of continue to be focused on doing all the things we need to do to prevent passage of this vaccine. And again, I recommend that virtually everybody get vaccinated. Now, again, there are a very, very small percentage of people that may have had an allergy to some of the components of the vaccine. And you can certainly talk to your provider about you know what are the components uh, if you're concerned about that, but but basically 99% of all people uh, sh should get that vaccine if we hope to eradicate this pandemic. And uh, uh, I think we're in the right direction now, and we need to keep focusing on all the things that uh, you know have gotten gotten us to this point uh, today. Perfect. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Very timely question. So many of us have it. Again, if you're just joining us, because I've seen a few more people join, um, if you would like to use a close, the live closed captioning, just click CC at the bottom of your screen. Uh, Dr. Wardy, I wonder if you can review with us the recently updated recommended pediatric treatment guidelines for Alport syndrome that were published by Dr. Cashton and Dr. Gross based on the early PROTECT study and how you view implementation of these guidelines for parents of young children, including babies and toddlers. And I, I do wanna tell our, our, our viewers that um, just today, Dr. Cashton actually did provide to Alport Center Foundation as a gift, a really great summary, a layman summary that patients can understand very well clearly um, about these guidelines. And so it's very timely. We're gonna make sure we get that out on our website and through our social media channels. Um, but I know lots of folks are interested in knowing what, is the, what do these updated guidelines mean in terms of implementation, Do, uh, Dr. Wardy? Yes, so um, as you su suggested, these were recently published. And I, I do wanna emphasize that these are the recommendations of two individuals. I mean, it's not like it's a consensus set of guidelines from a large group of people who went over all the literature. So we just have to rec recognize that. Although the, the two people, Dr. Cash and Dr. Gross, are experts in the field of Alport syndrome. So, you know, I don't want to minimize them, but I also want to make sure we all recognize that they haven't been, uh, you know, ratified by a, a, a large group, you know, like the American Society of Nephrology or the American Society of Pediatric Nephrology. So with that in mind, in 2013, uh, there were guidelines that were published, uh, recommendations, if you will, that were published, that suggested that individuals with Alport syndrome who had proteinuria should be started on uh, an ACE inhibitor, a RAS inhibition, uh, as a medication to try to decrease the, the rate of progression uh, of uh, kidney disease in patients with Alport syndrome. Subsequent to that, so really the last you know, seven years, there's been more data that's been collected uh, about the use of ACE inhibition, uh, drugs like ramipril or lisinopril, and its impact on the progression or worsening of kidney disease in patients with Alport syndrome. And that information has been very, very positive. I mean, it, it, it's shown um, that the rate of progression from let's say hematuria or blood in the urine to microalbuminuria, small amounts of protein in the urine, or to proteinuria, which is even more substantial amounts of proteinuria, um, the rate to these different uh, degrees, if you will, of kidney injury has actually been decreased in association with RAS inhibition, or again, the, the use of an ACE inhibitor. And in, a, in, a, in, a, in other studies that shown that, again, the, the risk of, of, uh, of uh, progression to end-stage kidney disease has actually significantly decreased in association with, with RAS inhibition. Uh, and then Dr. Gross, um, again, has conducted a couple studies, one, again, back in 2012, and then more recently, one published in 2020, um, that suggested that, you know, even earlier 
uh, initiation of, again, RAS inhibition or ACE inhibitor therapy may well be beneficial in patients with Alport syndrome. And again, the early PROTECT study, a small study, small number of patients, and, and not highly statistically significant, but very suggestive of the, the potential benefit of starting ACE inhibition or, or RAS inhibition at the time of diagnosis in two groups of patients. Uh, patients who are X-linked, uh, so those individuals who have X-linked disease, males, who are, as you know right now, are those who were 100% go on currently to have end-stage kidney disease, uh, or patients with autosomal recessive disease. And this is the disorder where each um, of the parents, each of the parents are sort of carriers, if you will, and then each of their children has a 25% risk of developing Alport syndrome. And so for those individuals, and I should also add that group who have autosomal recessive disease, they also all progress at, at present to end-stage kidney disease. So these are the two high-risk groups of Alport syndrome. The males with X-linked disease and those who have autosomal recessive disease, which could be males or females. So those two groups, the, the recommendations that are coming from Dr. Cashton and Dr. Gross are that they should initiate therapy with ramipril or lisinopril, both ACE inhibitors, at the time of diagnosis. So even before there's any evidence of what we call microalbuminuria or proteinuria, at this point in time, they'll likely just have hematuria alone. Um, in contrast, for those individuals, the females who used to be called carriers, but now we know they have X-linked disease, uh, or individuals what we call have autosomal dominant syndrome, who are less likely to progress, but still may progress, if they show evidence of microalbuminuria along with their hematuria, or of course, if they have proteinuria, um, then they should be also started on an ACE inhibitor at the same dosage like those individuals with X-linked males or the autosomal recessive group. So it's a, it's a much earlier initiation of ACE inhibitor therapy because it appears to really have a significant positive impact on delaying the progression of kidney disease in patients with Alport syndrome. Does not have any influence on hearing or on vision. It's really only impacting the, the kidney progression. But this is, this is I think, a, a, a major uh, you know, sort of development. Um, and I think, I think we need more information over time to really look at the impact if we, do, if we start these drugs at the time of diagnosis. We don't, we don't have hundreds or thousands of patients that have done this to be able to really say the long-term impact. It doesn't have the impact that we hope it will have. Um, but these are the recommendations uh, that are coming from Dr. Gross and Dr. Cashton. And I, seem to, I think that they're, they're very reasonable, but they still require ongoing observation in addition. So at what age, um, can you be clear that um, it, when you say time of diagnosis, I think Dr. Cashton's um, recommendations say something uh, about at least a year old or something like that. Can you uh, yeah, speak so, to that? I yeah, so the publications do in fact say uh, for children that are beyond one or two years of age. Okay. Um, and, I, and I actually emailed Dr. Cashton that today uh, and, it just, and he emailed me back because I wanted to make sure I understood from his perspective, you know, why that cutoff. And, I, and, and, you know, his response was, and I think it was very reasonable, that we want to make sure, number one, that it's safe. Um, and, you know, many of these individuals are going to have normal blood pressure. And so now you're talking about using an ACE inhibitor. And, and again, for those of you who aren't familiar with ACE inhibitors, they're great drugs to lower blood pressure. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're not creating a problem um, while we're trying to solve another problem, right? So we don't want someone to have very low blood pressure. If you take somebody who's got normal blood pressure and then give them a blood pressure medicine, you know, there's a risk of them having, you know, very low blood pressure. And so I think really um, waiting until beyond probably two years of age uh, was really from a, a safety standpoint. And we may find over time uh, that that the recommendations will even expand, you know, beyond what we what they're currently making, even to the younger patients. But I think at this time, again, to be safe but still aiming to be effective, uh, Dr. Cash and Dr. Rhodes are suggesting that beyond one or two years of age is, is the time to start these medications. Of course, well, with, you know. Go ahead. Go ahead, Lisa. I was just going to say, with genetic testing, you know, I'm sure you're you're really aware that more and more people are actually. Uh, 
becoming aware of their accurate and earlier diagnosis with, with Alport syndrome, um, you know, earlier in the years, so often than that the very young children are getting diagnosed, um, which is very helpful, obviously, for treatment, um, for research, for treatment, for changing things. Um, and one family was asking about, you know, for their really young, uh, young son, um, liquid ACE inhibitors for pediatric patients with Alport syndrome. Um, do you have uh, any recommendations on which ones and uh, cost effectiveness? We have one family that's actually really struggling to get that covered by insurance. And sure. do you have suggestions uh, about that and, and what type of, of liquid uh, ACE inhibitor would be, would be best? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, again, if you go to the recommendations that are coming from Dr. Cashin and Dr. Gross, they've really only recommended two different ACE inhibitors, one Ramipril and one Lisinopril. Now, you know, Ramipril has been used for a while, especially in Europe, and there was a study called the ESCAPE study, which is a, a very, you know, a well-performed prospective study, not of patients with Alport syndrome, but of, of children with chronic kidney disease. Uh, and Ramipril it was the ACE inhibitor that was used there. And so I think Dr. Gross and Cashin said, well, let's, let's take that experience and the dosage of medications that were used with Ramipril and apply them to the patients with Alport syndrome. Because the goal here is the same. It's really to decrease proteinuria. We know that proteinuria or albuminuria is bad for kidneys. Uh, and if one has ongoing proteinuria, that lends itself to progression of the kidney disease. And that's the same thing, the same target, if you will, that was being used in the, in the ESCAPE trial. Um, in, in the ESCAPE trial was also trying to control blood pressure. So the Alport group is a little bit different because many of the patients with the Alport, when they start Ramipril or Lisinopril, will have normal blood pressure. So we're not aiming here to necessarily lower blood pressure, but we're aiming to get the other benefit of the ACE inhibitor, which is decreased proteinuria or albuminuria. So Ramipril is recommended by Dr. Gross and Cashin, uh, as is lisinopril, because lisinopril is a very good drug. It's a very good ACE inhibitor, and it's one that we commonly use uh, in the U.S. and beyond the U.S. So I, I think pediatric nephrologists feel very comfortable with both of these agents. We know that they're safe. We know that they're effective uh, in terms of both blood pressure management and decreasing proteinuria. And so I think those are why the two agents have, have been recommended. I guess we get into the next step, which you had talked about lowering blood pressure. And I guess one of the things that a lot of uh, parents have questions about, I know we've received a lot of questions about this is, um, what does tolerating an ACE or ARB really mean to you as a, as a physician? And, and how do you recommend uh, treatment with ACE and ARBs? You know, if, if your son or daughter is really experiencing dizziness uh, on a regular basis, they've really changed their lifestyle to deal with the ACE and ARBs. Um, you know, not really participating in sports anymore to get their heart rate up or, or activities, you know, physical activities. How do you view tolerating the drug and how would you guide us as parents about that? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And, and you know, I think when we practice medicine, um, we have to practice personalized medicine. So in other words, we have to look at the individual and the response to any kind of intervention at that individual, because one individual may, may have no side effects from a drug where another individual on the same dosage may have side effects. So I, I think we have to look at everybody uh, again as, as a, an individual and decide what can they tolerate and what do they find tolerable and how does it impact their quality of life? Because I don't think we, none of us wanna have a significant negative impact on quality of life based on the interventions that we use. So if I saw somebody with Alport syndrome and they had, let's say they had microalbuminuria and I said, well, we really need to start the, uh, an ACE inhibitor. I would do that. And then I would you know, be talking to the family and talking to the child themselves to see how they're tolerating it from their perspective. If they say, I, I can't play any sports, you know, my life is you know, really, I'm having negative re responses to this medicine because I can't do anything I wanna do. Well, the first thing I would obviously do is try to lower the dosage of the drug. I mean, that's the first thing. And, and try to get to the minimally acceptable uh, dose of drug where somebody said they can tolerate it. Um, if they can't tolerate it at all and their quality of life is, is very negative on that drug, then I, then I think you can't use the drug. Um, and you know, in, with Ramipril or Aswinopril, I guess I would try the alternative drug if they were on Ramipril and, it, and 
they were, weren't tolerating it, I would try lisinopril and see if they would tolerate that. So I, you know, I think you do what you can do, but I think that it has to be a partnership between the provider and the family and the child to decide what can and what can not be used based on tolerance. But you know, it's 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 even more difficult when you say, well, here's a drug, an ACE inhibitor that we know in the majority of patients with Alport syndrome is going to be beneficial. So we hate to get to a situation where we can't use it at all in somebody who has evidence of kidney disease. Um, but again, we have to look at, at the patient. I, I also want to point out that, you know, the, the impact of these drugs may be different, again, depending upon the severity of, of your Alport syndrome. So those patients with X, males with X-linked disease, those patients with autosomal recessive disease are those where it's probably most important, right? Because we know that without those kind of interventions, the likelihood of progressing to end-stage kidney disease is almost 100%. Whereas in right. individuals with autosomal dominant disease or females with X-linked disease, especially if they don't have proteinuria, they're going to be less likely to progress. So we have to take all those things into consideration when making those decisions. Appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I'm sorry to stay so long on, on this topic of um, ACEs and ARBs, but as you know, it's a standard of care. Uh, yep. for our families and there were a lot of questions about them. So we're gonna stay with this topic for a short time and sure. then we'll move on. A couple questions. One is about uh, a question that came in. Uh, what about en uh, enalapril? Is enalapril? that also? Yeah, all the prills, you know, the sinopril, remipril, enalapril, those are all uh, ACE inhibitors. Uh, and so I think that's another one that potentially could be used. Not, it's not part of the recommendation, if you will, that was published by Drs. Gross and Cashton but I think it, it, it's certainly some, another, another ACE inhibitor that could be used. And, um, you know, the other thing that happens often then with these drugs uh, comes along with is hyperkalemia and, you know, the potassium issue. And I had a couple, uh, we did have quite a few parents that wrote in about that. Um, what's the standard of care once the diet is controlled? And should patients stop medication um, or should they add a potassium binder? Uh, do they stay on with their medication? Uh, and then add the potassium binder or, um, and do younger patients, pediatric patients do better on binders. Um, so if you could speak to that for us. Sure. Well, hyperkalemia is clearly one of the potential side effects of an ACE inhibitor. Um, obviously it's, it's, it's more of a problem as the kidney disease is more advanced, more severe. That's when you tend to see problems with the hyperkalemia. Um, I, I think diet is, is the first thing one would do is to intervene and make sure that the patient is not getting a lot of citrus fruits and other, you know, high bananas and a, and a lot of high potassium containing foods. Um, binders are a potential option. Um, you know, the, the typical binder historically has been something called Caxlate, um, which is a little bit hard to tolerate in, in, in reality. There's a newer binder called Paterimer and Paterimer is a good potassium binder. The problem is there are no, uh, it's not approved in pediatrics. And in fact, there are no studies. We're, we're, we're actually currently conducting a study of the use of paterimer uh, in children uh, to help control their potassium. Now, that's not to say that no children have gotten paterimer. I know that they have, um, but it's not an approved drug in the pediatric age range. It is approved in the, in the adult uh, age range. So that's another option. Y you know, um, there have historically been the practice of when potassium has risen, in patients with advanced kidney disease, practitioners have stopped the ACE inhibitors because of hyperkalemia. But I will tell you there's, there's now been a very nice published study out of Europe to compare children with advanced kidney disease who stopped their ACE inhibitor or continued their ACE inhibitor. And what was found is that those patients who continued their ACE inhibitor had slower worsening of their kidney disease than those who stopped their ACE inhibitor. So, you know, in, in, in most situations, if you can somehow control the potassium and you have advanced kidney disease, it may well be to your benefit in slowing the, the worsening of your kidney disease. So diet is first, potentially modification of the drug dosage, of course, uh, and then and a potassium binder in some situations. Thank you, very important. Um, what if patients cannot tolerate an ACE or an ARB anymore? Are there other medications? and uh, is there any evidence for SGL2 TI usage in teens and young adults? 
Yeah. Well, there are uh, aldosterone inhibitors that, that have been used. Not, they're not part of the recommendations that have come out from Drs. Cashton and Gross, although uh, in their publication, they do mention uh, that that's, a, that's an, a, another potential uh, class of drugs that could be used. In terms of the SGLT2 uh, inhibitors, um, that's a new class of drugs that seems to be a wonderful class of drugs. Um, and it's been approved and, and really having a, a major a positive impact on uh, the adult population in terms of their kidney disease. Uh, Lisa, as you well know, there have been no studies yet in pediatrics. Um, uh, they have been submitted uh, uh, protocols to the FDA, and I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that those studies will be initiated in the near future. And again, as you know, I have uh, pushed the drug manufacturers to include patients with Alport syndrome uh, in the population of children who are going to be tested. So I don't, I don't think, I don't see in the future, uh, in the immediate future, a study of Alport syndrome patients only. Uh, but I'm, uh, I'm cautiously optimistic that we have, we'll be able to get some children with Alport syndrome uh, into those SGLT2 inhibitor studies, so that we can look at the impact uh, of the drug. And I, and I think I'm. Again, I'm optimistic that that will have a significant impact on patients, all patients with chronic kidney disease, Alport syndrome, as well as other causes uh, of CKD. Thank you for being an advocate. I am sure. aware of all your I know you are. remarkable know you are. efforts for us, and we greatly appreciate you being an advocate for us. Have, you have a seat at the table, and we appreciate yeah. that you are always keeping us, our patient community in mind. We really right. do appreciate that. Glad to help. Um, in terms of these, we'll move a little bit to the hearing loss questions because we had quite a few about them. You did note that uh, already someone had written this question of, of whether ACE inhibitors have an effect on hearing loss. You have said that that is not the case. Um, are there any studies that are looking at outport specific treatments for the sensorineural hearing loss that occurs in the majority of outport cases? Is that something um, that you're aware of? Yeah, I mean, I think that there are studies going on, and uh, and as you well know, you have an audiologist now working with you in the Alport syndrome. So I, I think that that's been, a, a, I guess, an understudied area with Alport syndrome. I think the focus, as you know, over the years has been the kidney disease uh, because we just sort of watched that uh, progress, but we, we recognize that there were some interventions that may impact that. I think hearing has been um, uh, maybe a bit of a stepchild. Um, and, you know, we, we know that it's all related to the same genetic defect and its impact on collagen. Uh, but the real, you know, definitive reasons for the loss of hearing are, have not really been well defined. Uh, and so I think we recognize that hearing aids are important. I think we recognize that uh, hearing deficits are very common, especially in males with uh, X-linked uh, disease. And so uh, hearing screening very early on is important. And it's really uh, hearing uh, screening for anybody who has any evidence of uh, a deficit in hearing or deficits in speech, especially in the young children, um, need to see an audiologist. Uh, and again, with, with the potential of hearing aids. But I think it's, there's, there's a lot of work to do from an audiological uh, the aspect of care with Albert syndrome. But uh, unfortunately, the ACEs, the ARBs, any of the new medications that we have uh, focusing on the, the kidney disease do not appear to have any substantial impact on the hearing loss. And as a pediatric nephrologist, with your patients with Alport syndrome, how often do you encourage them and at what point do you encourage them to begin to see an audiologist? Uh, at what age and how often? Yeah, well, this you know has also been addressed in the, those new recommendations from Dr. Gross and Cashton. Uh, and so for those, the males with X-linked disease, probably at around five or six years of age is when they should first have a hearing screen done, or certainly if they have any evidence of hearing deficits, or again any problems with speech uh, for the for the young child, uh, for for the uh, patients with uh, uh, and, and the same pretty much the same with autosomal recessive early on in life, uh, but the autosomal dominant group or the the uh, females with uh, X-linked disease, um, probably if there's evidence of proteinuria with a progressive disease. They should certainly have a hearing screen or if there's any evidence whatsoever of any hearing deficits. And patients with autosomal dominant disease are much less likely to have hearing deficits. But if they have one, you know, have any sense of having one, then they should see an audiologist as well. So it really, it really sort of couples with the severity of the disease, the severity of the kidney disease. Those patients who are having more severe kidney disease are more apt to have problems uh, with, with hearing as well. Thank you. 
Um, we're going to move over to a topic that I think a lot of us parents of kids with Alport syndrome of all ages um, that is near and dear to our heart. And I think you and I have had many of these conversations. There's a lot to discuss around communicating um, with your child with Alport syndrome. You know, from the quickly increasing numbers of Alport syndrome foundation membership, it seems genetic testing is really helping families gain earlier and accurate diagnosis. It's helpful in terms of treatment and disease management, but it also means these caregivers need to be prepared and cognizant of how to talk to their children about their kidney disease at all ages. So um, I know this is a, a great topic that you you and I have discussed a lot and, and I really appreciate your advice in this area. How do you guide your Alport families related to communication with their uh, with their young one, young one with Alport syndrome? Well, uh, it's a great question. It, it's, a com it's complicated um, because uh, once again, we have to individualize um, to the patient and to the family in terms of, you know, what is the, is the patient ready to receive? I think first things first is making sure that the parents have a, a very good understanding of Alport syndrome. Because I think a lot of times we see, we see families um, and, and, and they've been seen in a, in a nephrology clinic for years. And then you ask them some of the more simple, what we would say as a physician, the simple questions. And when you really drill down, they say, I don't really know the answer to that question. So, you know, I think health literacy is a huge issue. Uh, and that sometimes is overlooked uh, in, in our clinics. Uh, and health literacy means making sure that the families and the patients understand what we're sharing with them, understand the information we're sharing with them. So I think one has to drill down on that first to make sure that families understand. Do you, do you understand what a creatinine is? Do you understand what BUN is? Do you understand what electrolytes are? And I can tell you, I'm, I'm, I used to be surprised. I'm no longer surprised at how many people don't know and if they don't know, it's again, as, as, a, as a parent or as a child, you should not say, gee, I'm sort of, I'm not, you know, very smart. I should know that. No, it's not your problem. It's the healthcare provider's problem because we didn't really explain these things well enough to you. So never, never feel, you know, shy or bashful or, you know, inadequate because you don't understand something. Please, you should always ask your provider. I don't understand what you were telling me. Please explain that to me better. So once we make sure that the families understand, then I think we have to work with them to, to get a better feel for, you know, what, can, what could we share with their child? At what level of their child is and from a cognition standpoint? What, what might they understand? Um, and I think, you know, and that's going to change and it's going to evolve over time as that five-year-old child becomes a 10-year-old child, becomes a teenager, because we're going to have to give them more and more information. I think, you know, uh, it's education is everything. And if we hope that our kids get the best of care, we have to then provide them with that education so that they control their disorder. The disorder does not control them. Uh, and so I think education is key. But again, I think that we have to individualize what we can tell any individual child. Sometimes I think you need to share this, you know, the sort of a strategy with a psychologist who's working with you because, you know, we oftentimes will have teenagers who are pretty upset that they're not exactly like their peers, that they have to deal with this issue of Alport syndrome, that they have to wear a hearing aid. And a lot of times they're gonna push back and, and they don't want any education. And then I think we have to sort of, sort of figure out how do we overcome that? How do we overcome their denial in some respects uh, and educate them? Because you know, education uh, will lead to success, but they have to be accepting of that education. So it's truly a, it's an, an, an individualized kind of a process um, that you, you know you need to work as a team, the family, you know, the parents, the child, the nephrologist, maybe the psychologist, all have to work together to figure out what's the best means of providing that information. Lastly, I want to say, you know, what's what's great about the Alport syndrome is your your group of adolescents that you have, and you know, I think getting more and more information from that group who have lived through Alport syndrome, it's going to be extraordinarily beneficial. To, to respond to the question you asked. Because I think that they can tell you as much or more than I can about how to best get into the, the minds of kids with Alport syndrome and at, and at what rate to do that. Because they've lived this. And so, you know, they're the ones who really can, I think, share some extraordinarily valuable insights in terms of how to educate children now and in the future who have Alport syndrome. 
Thank you. And thank you for working as, with us as a guide on that project. Dr. Wardy is referring to a year long project we've been working on with a group of teenagers um, from across the United States and some international um, sort of capturing their and documenting their insights about uh, their experiences and living with Alport syndrome and what they would want their medical providers and their families to understand about their lived experience. So it's been a great project and we will be sharing more about what we've learned so far. Um, and that goes into really this question of specifically, if you have any tips about compliance, we have a couple parents who wrote in and said, you know, they have teenagers and it's really challenging uh, to get them to com be compliant with their medications. And um, I'm not sure what you would typically, you know, share with the family or talk uh, to uh, one of your teen patients and their families, uh, how you would guide them in this way. Yeah, well, I, I from one, I, I try to make sure, again, that the teens are educated, that they understand not only you need to take this medicine, but they understand why the medicine is important. I take time at the clinic visits with the teens alone without the parents in the room. And I think that that is exceedingly important. And that's part of the whole transition process. And when I say transition, I mean moving from pediatric care to adult care. They have to be seen from a developmental standpoint as the teenagers that they are. And teenagers wanna sort of spread their wings uh, and do their own things. Now, parents who have children with a chronic illness, it's hard. It's hard to let go and, and to give a little bit more leeway on that rope uh, because you don't want the children to make mistakes, but we all make mistakes. Uh, we have to recognize that. And sometimes the kids are gonna, they're gonna fall and then they'll get up. Um, and when I say fall is maybe they're not getting their medicines as, as ideally as they should, or as the parents would give it to them. Um, sometimes we have to tolerate a little bit of that. Not a lot of it, but a little bit of that. So I think from the compliance standpoint, first thing is education. Make sure they understand why they're getting it and make sure if as, as possible that there can be communication between the provider and that teenager about what they like or don't like about that medication. You know, I always encourage my kids that if, if, if maybe, they're, maybe they're dizzy from their ACE inhibitor or maybe they're having upset stomach from one of their medicines. If I don't know about that, I can't potentially modify their course so it'll be more tolerable and maybe they'll be more compliant. So I think, you know, making sure that the best you can, that there's a good working relationship between the providers and the teenagers is, is essential if one hopes to optimize compliance. No children like to take medicines. No adult like to take medications. You know, we don't, but they have to understand why they're important, what they hope to achieve with that. And again, that open line of communication that's, I think, the most important thing. And I should also add that if you look at compliance studies, the number one reason that kids aren't compliant and adults is that they forget to take their medicines. And you might say, well, how is that possible? They've been on these medications for 12 years. How can they forget? They do forget. They really do forget. And a teenager is not thinking about medications first in most cases. They're thinking about boys and girls and how they look and their peer relationships. And they do forget. Uh, and so sometimes it's just working with them and figure out, well, what are some cues that we can use, whether it's their, their smartphone, whether it's when they brush their teeth in the morning and the evening, hopefully, uh, how can they somehow get medications into their everyday schedules so it's not a significant burden and at the same time they get what they need? All great advice, all great advice. And as a person who's going through this right now, and my own 18 year old had his first telehealth meeting with his nephrologist by himself for the first time, I understand how difficult it is to let go, but it's important. <laughs> so it, I appreciate, it, it, I appreciate it, that. Um, we have a question from a, a patient about how can I best prepare for if and when my son may need a transplant? Are there any pre-medical steps I can take? Can I test family members who have inquired to be donors? Is there any way to tell approximately when he could start to decline? I've always been told there's no way to know. So this is a question, all those sort of questions together are questions that many, many families have. Sure, sure. Well, um, nobody has a crystal ball, um, but um, we do have ways to have a pretty good idea in terms of how rapidly someone is progressing. And in fact, just last week, um, the National Kidney Foundation released a, what we call a pediatric risk calculator. Now this is for providers, um, but this is something actually that I helped initiate um, and it's, it's on the website for the National Kidney Foundation. And what it does is that it allows you to sort of predict based upon the laboratory data of that patient, 
um, how rapidly their kidney disease will in fact progress. And this is all based on, on, on pediatric kidney disease data from what you mentioned, the C-KID study, which is a study of over a thousand children with chronic kidney disease. So it's a little bit of a crystal ball to say, well, how fast is the kidney disease going to progress? And when is, how, what's the likelihood of my child uh, or my patient going on to have end-stage kidney disease and the need for dialysis and transplantation? So I think that is, a, 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 it's a brand new tool that all nephrologists, all pediatric nephrologists have access to uh, and can put in your child's numbers, your child's values from the laboratory and get some idea. And it's particularly nice because it allows us to put in data longitudinally. I mean, you know, from 2018, 2019, 2020, I can put in all those information and give me some pretty good idea in terms of how rapidly it's, it's gonna progress. We also know in patients with Alport syndrome, we got a pretty good idea from longitudinal studies, um, in most cases, how rapidly the disease will progress. So I think we, we do have some information. Now, some of the information is changing now as we look at the initiation of the ACE inhibitor therapy and that the, the rate of progression is decreasing. So, you know, we, we, we have new information, which is all good information. Um, but I think, you know, in my own center, when we have patients whose GFR, and, and hopefully you all know what that means, but if you don't, glomerular filtration rate, that's one means of looking at kidney function. We look at serum creatinine and we use the serum creatinine to estimate the GFR. Um, and in my own center, when we have patients whose GFR is in the range of 30, we're already talking to them about end-stage kidney disease, dialysis and transplant. We're already beginning to think about, well, who might be those donors? So that when the time comes, when the GFR is more in the range of five to 10, when transplantation is, is really something that one should strongly consider initiating, we've already talked about and already surveyed our family members and, and others who may be donors, um, if, if that's feasible for a living donor transplant uh, in terms of their uh, potential availability to be a donor. So um, I think we do have a much better idea when these things will happen. And I think as families, you should not be afraid to talk about these issues when you get to a GFR of around 30, you get to a CKD stage four, uh, because just because you talk about it doesn't mean it's going to happen any quicker. But when you talk about it, you'll just be more prepared. And I, and I think that preparation is so important so that the kids get the, uh, if they're going to go to end stage disease, hopefully have the shortest time on dialysis possible. Excellent. Agreed. Thank you. Um, I'm going to put a couple questions to you together that are related. Um, one question was uh, that a patient wrote in was, what, uh, what can I do to lower my son's chances of kidney failure or to extend the, pro uh, extend the process um, besides medications? And I know one thing that we talk about a lot is, is diet, is a renal diet, renal friendly diet. And another patient had wrote in, um, wondering your thoughts on plant-based or vegan or vegetarian diets for children. She says, everything I've read has said not to do this due to growth and development needs, but at what age would it would be okay? And so how do you see that, Dr. Wardy? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that the, the, you know, the main things we can modify in terms of progression of chronic kidney disease is blood pressure. That's, that's number one. And that's uh, one of the major factors that influence worsening of kidney function. Uh, and so uh, the target is about the 50th percentile for age group. And, you know, all your providers uh, can look at, uh, look at the blood pressure charts and know where is the 50th percentile. When we looked at that escape trial that I talked about in Europe, lowering the blood pressure uh, to that 50th percentile range uh, was associated with a slowing of the worsening of kidney function. So aggressive blood pressure control is, is exceedingly important. So again, in addition to medications, it's diet. Uh, and diet would, would you know, the, the, the primary uh, uh, approach to diet would be make sure it's a salt restricted diet, not a high salt diet, because as we know, salt can increase blood pressure. So that'd be the, the one thing that you'd be looking at from a dietary standpoint. The, you know, the other thing that it obviously leads to progression of kidney disease is protein in the urine, but really altering the diet doesn't have a substantial impact on the protein loss in the urine. That really is controlled with the medications. That's controlled with the ACEs and the ARB therapies. So I would say, you know, from a diet st standpoint, you want a healthy diet. You know, we're, we're dealing with pediatrics. So these are children who are growing and developing, and we don't want to significantly compromise their nutritional status. And in fact, 
back in the 70s, uh, there was a study by an author, Wingen, um, that looked at um, a, a, a significant protein-restricted diet in children versus sort of the standard diet. Uh, and what was shown is that it didn't really have a significant positive impact on slowing the progression of kidney disease in children. That was the, the largest, what we call prospective uh, study in children on a significant modification of diet. So I, you know, I recommend that, that my patients have a healthy diet, um, again, not high in fats, not high in salt, but providing the protein that they need, the energy they need to grow. Um, that, that's, I think, is the most important thing in, in the pediatric age range. And, and I think will, will lend itself to have the best outcomes. When they're adults, they may want to restrict things a, a bit more, but in pediatrics, growth and development is, is, is certainly uh, extremely important. And so working with, a, 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 ideally working with a pediatric renal dietitian, I think is really important because those are the folks that have the expertise along with your nephrologist, of course, uh, on what is the best diet for you. And, and, I, and I think to, if you can have access to a pediatric renal dietitian, to help you uh, work out a diet, that would be uh, uh, the best use of the resources available. That makes sense. Um, on the other side of the coin of medications, we talked about medications that we should be taking. Um, what about medications that we should avoid or that um, you know, pediatric patients with Alport syndrome should avoid? Well, I mean, I think as, as you get more advanced kidney disease, the, the non-steroidals, um, you know, the Advils and the Naprosins and all, those can have a negative impact on your kidney function. Um, uh, obviously, drugs, potassium-sparing diuretics that increase your potassium, uh, those can be problematic uh, in, in patients that are, are getting an ACE or R because they can cause, you know, uh, hyperkalemia or, or high potassium level. So I, I, I think those are the, are the drugs uh, but most of the drugs, uh, I think, in Alport syndrome, um, you know, can be used. Uh, it's only when patients get on to more severe uh, kidney failure in that stage four, stage five kidney disease, where you have to really be uh, looking at the medications you're prescribing. Excellent. And I'm going to say, um, I want to make sure that I'm answering questions that come in. I'm, I'm still answering questions, so please keep on asking them in the, in the Q&A uh, function here. Um, a uh, question would be, do you recommend that all pediatric Alport patients see a pediatric renal dietitian? Is that something you recommend for all your patients? Well, I, yeah, I think so. I mean, I mean, somebody who's just been diagnosed and just has some, you know, hematuria, blood in the urine only, maybe not absolutely necessary. But I think as we, as we progress in kidney disease um, and, and even early chronic kidney disease, I think having input from a pediatric renal dietitian uh, is important. There are new guidelines uh, that have just been published by the Pediatric Renal Nutrition Task Force that I was a member of as well. Uh, and this is a task force that um, combined expertise uh, international. So from both the US and Europe, and we've put out um, some recent guidelines on the assessment of nutrition, uh, calcium and phosphorus, potassium, uh, energy, tube feedings. All of these are, are guidelines that have been published in the last one year. Uh, and they apply to all patients with chronic kidney disease. So stage two and beyond. So I, I think, uh, you know, they may not have to see a dietitian very, very frequently early on, but an annual visit uh, with a pediatric renal dietitian, if you have chronic kidney disease, uh, I think is, is certainly indicated. And, and, and if your kidney disease progresses into the more severe stages, uh, you may need to see one or it may benefit you to see one on a more frequent basis. Excellent, thank you. And I will follow up with you about those guidelines so that we can share them oh, with sure. everyone. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Um, uh, someone just wrote in, how early can you potentially use the new calculator you were talking about uh, that we can find on the NKF website? My son's almost four, but we've known he has Alport since he was born and has had check-ins with nephrologists semi-annually. Is it too early to tell yet at age four? Well, no, it, I mean, it's, it's you know, when we, we looked at the C kid study, which is again, the the patient population, population upon which the calculator was developed, these are children from one to 16 years of age uh, in the C-KID study. So um, it's absolutely applicable to the child who's four years of age. So you should just talk to your nephrologist. And, and I will tell you very truthful, many pediatric nephrologists probably don't even know this exists yet. Um, so you can, you can educate your nephrologist. Well, that's a scary thought, isn't it? Um, but uh, <laughs> But it was, just, it was just made available last week. 
um, uh, you know, on the, on the website. So you can tell your nephrologist there is a pediatric risk calculator on the NKF website. They can go to it. They can put in your child's data from the last two years and, and get some, um, you know, some risk-related information for you. Thank you. I would say actually there are a lot of patients probably on this call who feel like they're often educating their nephrologist. Well. So <laughs> I'm sorry, just saying. <laughs> um, no, no. They're, they're, we all don't have Dr. Ward. He's available to us who know a lot about Alport syndrome. Um, so all these kinds of tips and information is great for us to be able to um, help spread information to our pediatric nephrologist about our rare disease. So thank you. Um, I have a question. Uh, you, you don't have to go and say, Dr. Ward, he told me to do <laughs> I won't. We promise. That's okay, we promise. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a question about, um, uh, let's see, um, that I, this may not be your area because it's about pregnancy, but it says, I had mm. severe preeclampsia with my first pregnancy due to outport. Will it get worse every pregnancy? I'm not sure if that's something that you um, would be familiar with or whether, because I can follow up with this patient if that's not something you. Yeah. Remember I told you at the very beginning, I would tell you what I know and what I don't okay. know. Okay. Thank you. All right. This is one I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's okay. Okay. Um, one patient writes that, um, you know, speaking about, you know, pediatric nephrology, um, that she just finds that um, pediatric nephrologists seem to be much more, you know, proactive um, than the adult nephrologists um, in, in looking at these rare diseases. Is that something that you find to be true or, um, and any suggestions about how we can uh, transition that from pediatric nephrology yeah. to? Yeah, no, I, I, think it's, I think it's very true. Um, you know, I think historically adult nephrologists dealt with end stage disease. Um, and, and didn't deal with these rare diseases. And, you know, historically, uh, unfortunately, patients with uh, rare diseases in pediatrics sometimes didn't live uh, into, uh, you know, adult uh, age groups. And so the adult nephrologists weren't trained in some of these disorders. Um, and because it's a rare disorder, any one adult nephrologist may never see that case, or they may only see one or two of any particular disorder. And so I think the adult nephrologists have been sort of handcuffed uh, in this situation. And what we're trying to do is train them, if you will, in some respects and work together because we have so many kids who have rare diseases that are clearly living into adulthood. And we want them to continue to thrive into adulthood. Um, so it, it, it's, a, it's a challenge. Um, Lisa, as you know, I meet with my adult nephrology um, colleagues in Kansas City on a regular basis uh, and, and an annual basis. And we talk about the transitioning of young adults with chronic kidney disease into adult care with chronic kidney disease. And we share with them what we know and they share with us about their programs. And then we try to sort of develop in a, in a partnership the ways to make that transition as, as seamless as possible. And then we have to actually educate our adult uh, counterparts sometimes in terms of the, the, the complications that exist and the medications that are optimal uh, for the disorder. So it's, it's a learning process, you know, and we, Alports is an, a great example of doing genetic testing, molecular testing. You know, nowadays we can do such great testing of the genes to see if there's mutations that are associated with Alport syndrome. And doing genetic testing where, where it's sort of almost routine in pediatrics it's very new to the, our adult providers. They never did this in the past. And so we are educating them about that. And, and again, if you look at the medical literature, there's more and more articles that are directed to the adult providers to educate them about genetic testing and how that's so important. So I think we're getting there, um, uh, but the pediatric nephrologists need to continue to work with and in part educate our adult counterparts uh, about the care of patients with Alport syndrome and other rare diseases associated with chronic kidney disease. Excellent. I think you, know, you are an advocate within your own community of pediatric nephrologists. Yep. We are advocates in our community as patients. Um, and in line with that, I'm going to ask you about something that um, you and I had a conversation about uh, about a year or so ago, which was really surprising to me. I learned from it and, and um, I thought I wanted to share this with the, the rest of the, the parents that I know are, are in this meeting um, and ask whether you think it's something that we should be advocating for ourselves. Uh, I think you had talked about, you ask for your patients once a year to do their blood pressure overnight 
um, mm -hmm. something yeah. that you learned from that and why that's important. Um, can you share with the audience? Because I find that fascinating and, and I've asked our own doctor to do that. Sure. Well, there's something called ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, and that's a, a 24 hour blood pressure monitor uh, that measures the blood pressure every 30 minutes around the clock. And many patients with, and children, especially with advanced chronic kidney disease, um, can actually have abnormal blood pressures at night while they're asleep that are not, not necessarily detected during the daytime. That's called masked hypertension. Masked meaning you don't see it during the daytime, but it's there at night. And that masked hypertension can be associated with heart disease, thickening of the wall of the heart, and it can be associated with worsening of your kidney disease. And so for patients with advanced chronic kidney disease, we do, especially those who have any evidence of high blood pressure, we do do annual ambulatory blood pressure monitor evaluations to decide how we might best treat that high blood pressure. In some situations, if we find that a child has high blood pressure in the nighttime only, but not during the daytime, that will help us determine when we should give their blood pressure medicines. And we, we might give their blood pressure medicines at night before they go to bed, as opposed to the morning, when we know that their blood pressure all day is quite normal. So it's, it's something um, that's recommended um, by the American Academy of Pediatrics for children with chronic kidney disease to do 24 hour, what we call ABPM studies. Um, uh, the kids don't like doing it, to be very truthful, because they're hooked to a, this monitor. I mean, they're not hooked to a machine, if you will, like they, they can't get out of bed. They can go to school theoretically with it, but many of them won't go to school with it and they'll do it on, on a weekend. Um, but it provides valuable information in addition to regular blood pressure monitoring at their office visits. So it's complementary, but I think in some situations it's helpful. And especially if you have somebody who has uncontrolled blood pressure uh, and then you change their blood pressure medicines, especially if their blood pressure is at night only, the only way to know whether the alteration in medications has worked is to do that 24 hour monitor again and see if the blood pressure has improved. So it's just something else to talk to your nephrologist about, especially if, if high blood pressure is a concern, if thickening of the wall, the heart has been noted on echocardiogram, an ambulatory blood pressure monitor evaluation uh, may well be helpful to you. Thank you for addressing that. We've really come uh, near the end here. We just have a, a few moments left. Uh, so I just want to ask you if there's anything else that you would like uh, to share with us or, or say to um, Outport moms and dads and caretakers. Sure, um, sure. I want to thank you for your time and, and I'll let you uh, um, have the last words here. And I want to tell our audience that, you know, if we didn't get to, I think, get to every question, I think that, that that was written to us in advance. Um, but if you have other questions, please feel free to write to us at info at alportsyndrome.org. And we'll make sure we get your questions answered. Uh, Dr. Wardy. Yeah, just the last thing I just want to mention, because I've was been involved in the Cardinal study, and that's another important study on a drug called Bardoxolone. And I will tell you that study was just completed. Um, the manuscript has been written, um, and hopefully it'll be published in the not too distant future. But I will tell you on a positive note, it shows some positive results uh, benefiting uh, uh, children and young adults uh, with Alport syndrome in terms of delaying the progression of kidney disease. So I think that's one drug, and there's many, many other drugs I know that more and more they're on the horizon that may benefit patients with Alport syndrome. So I see bright lights in the future for Alport syndrome. I think with more and more what we're learning and implementing. Um, I, I think that, uh, I think the course of Alport syndrome is gonna be much, much different uh, in 2021 and in the future when compared to a decade ago. And that's, that's a, it's a good thing. And, and hopefully I can be part of the continued uh, uh, improved therapeutic uh, advances for, for patients, Lisa, like you and like your son and like everybody with Alport syndrome. Thank you. I know you're working so hard in these areas and it makes um, us feel good to know that you're there, again, have the seat at the table and are working with these companies um, to bring the patient perspective and, and to make sure that everything's safe. And we appreciate that work that you're doing and bringing us hope. That's absolutely what we need. And, and I also am very hopeful about changing our, our stories, our family stories with Alport sure. syndrome. Thank you so much for giving up some of your you're vacation welcome. time <laughs> tonight. You're welcome to share uh, your, your perspective and guidance with us. Thank you so much. And thank you audience for joining us. We really appreciate it. If you have more questions, please uh, email us at info at Good night. Thank you all very, very much Bye, for everybody. attending. Thank you. Bye-bye.